Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt, for that. That was brilliant. Guys, uh, please show your appreciation for Matt for, for giving up his, uh, his time and his information there. Um, and we will kick off with some questions here. So this is from Chris, uh, Matt. So at yep. what age group do you think it is most suitable or even needed to start introducing the specific sets and reps uh, of times? Or does it even matter? Yeah, I'll, again, it, it all depends because it's kind of the, the main reason that you're doing the sets and reps is really to kind of, a lot, for, from my perspective anyway, and also working with the coaches, is that physical conditioning side of things because you want to work out like uh, the, the high intent, if you want to be working high intensity or you want to be working more of the endurance, which is important. But again, you don't want to be kind of worrying too much if you're working with like low, younger age groups about the sets and reps necessarily too much. Again, it's kind of also a feeling perspective. If you're working with young athletes and you're doing a 20 minute block of small sided games with no, um, no rest, then you know that that's too much really. So it's, it's kind of, I think, again, it's, it's useful for, for all age groups really to, to kind of work uh, in a blocks format really to try and break down each block. So you're not overworking players and giving them enough time to kind of get your drinks or get a rest. And uh, really, yeah, it kind of, it all depends on the group you're working with and the, their level really. Cause again, you don't want to worry too much because they're, if they're too young, but it's also kind of helps to structure the session a bit. And yeah, so I would say it's kind of all very dependent on your group really, to be honest. Perfect. Okay. A uh, question from Felix. Can Rondos enhance effective small sided games? Yeah, again, I think for Rondos are a great, um, great tool to use as well because they're all about developing that quick decision making and speed of play. So by using Rondos, like I think you've seen people have seen with like Man City and the, Spain from the 2008, 2012 sort of era, that they did a lot of Rondos and it does increase that kind of quick thinking. So like by building up your Rondos from like your small ones, maybe you do before training, like your 8v2s or 5v2s, those kind of build up and build up you can kind of progress them into a session so yeah i think that to be honest they're a great tool for for work for developing that kind of quick decision making and fast game speed really uh, again it's in small spaces but then you can gradually build them out and then improve that kind of decision making and yeah that, that intensity really yeah brilliant okay uh kieran hope i said that right uh can you send uh, some examples of small sided games that would be helpful well what we could do maybe if you don't mind matt is maybe go yeah. back to some examples in your slides yeah and just maybe i'll go back yeah, just um any any of these ones um, i can or i can yeah, go let's, back let's, let's go through here and just yeah. explain so can, them more in detail yeah so in terms of the first one's fairly evident it's just a, say a 10 v 10 game really with two goalkeepers so you're pretty much like an 11 v 11 and then it's obviously got your two kind of offside lines really and uh so it's basically just kind of um uh, a normal 10v10 but you're trying to work on those kind of pushing up the pitch elements for the defensive side of things as well as um, breaking in behind defenders so you've kind of got those clear zones to do that um, and then if we look at the kind of the one on the far right so the the no set pieces one that's a really good one we used it at Cardiff uh, quite a lot it's a it's like a, a, a variation on Bielsa's murder ball thing which is uh, a big pitch and sort of really large space but um, the, whenever the ball goes out, you're throwing the ball back in. So again, if you're working with kind of adults, it's a really good physical conditioning drill because it's so difficult. So yeah. it's literally just the, if the ball goes out, a coach that's maybe not got the ball will shout someone's name on the side. They'll throw it back and forwards and it's really good for, for that. And also technical actions, like lots of technical actions in a short period of time. Not so much tactically, but really good we did that for um blocks of five minutes with um two minutes rest so it was um really intense but um then we gave him enough rest and it was really good for our middle of the week conditioning really um then again i don't know if there's uh, i'll go through a few more of them um if we look at let's take uh yeah the, the middle one and the top so it's a 10 v 10 plus four so that's like um, looking at the kind of the floaters aspect. So this time it's goalkeepers. So this was used to get the goalkeepers involved to use their feet. So again, it's, it's, it's a great game to try and get goalkeepers involved for playing out through their feet. So they're only allowed a certain amount of touches. I think it was, I think it was two max two touches, one to two touches really. 
And the idea was to to use the goalkeepers to score into pretty much. So you're playing, you're passing, 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 and then you have to get, I think it was a t- 10 or so passes and then play it into a, a goalkeeper. And then they play it back to you and you keep going really. So it's kind of use that, um, it's looking at more really sort of switching a play really to get it from one side to the other and trying to find those gaps in the wide spaces. So trying to get, it's kind of mimicking that really. But um, yeah, um, if, uh, if you want to go through all of them, or shall I go through a few well, more? I think that's enough. I think that, yeah, yeah. you <laughs> obviously went uh, through it in the presentation, but yeah, uh, just yeah. I guess you're re-emphasising differences, how we just can tweak rules and get different outcomes. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question here uh, we had from Ivan. Um, so he's just asking about which of the small-sided games causes the most muscle damage in players. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so generally the, the kind of the smallest ones, so your high-intensity ones. So if I go back to that, um, I'll go back to the, the little graph before. Um, sorry. So if we look, yeah, this one. So um, generally like your 1v1s to 3v3s uh, kind of induce the most muscle damage because... Mm-hmm. It's lots of high intensity, like acceleration, deceleration work in a short period of time. So induce like a, a high amount of muscle damage. So your main ones really are the small sided games. So you kind of normally we'd put them towards the beginning of the week. So like four days before a game. So players aren't, haven't got that fatigue, that muscle damage, because it takes up to, can take up to 48, 72 hours for that damage to reduce. Yeah. Um, so normally it's those, high, that, those small 1v1, 2v2s because it's just so intense. But Perfect. then also 11 v 11s are induced quite a lot of muscle damage as well because that's the a game, it's a high-intensity work. So predominantly it's those 1v1s to 3v3s really. And then really 11, and the medium sort of size games are the ones you'd use on maybe recovery days or ones you're not so focused on, uh, I don't know, physical conditioning because they're a little bit easier really. So say that. Sorry, good. Cool. Just a question I had. Yeah. Um, with, with clubs currently going through kind of crazy compact schedule with like a game every other couple of days yeah. how how might that affect their their planning and training and with their use of small sided games what do you think if you were to kind of take a, a educated guess as to how they're planning their training between those games what, what do you think that looks like yeah so it's it's, it's common like uh, across the world like particularly saying like the, the championship in the uk like it's it's game after game so saturday tuesday so generally you'd use your sort of intensive small sided games only for the players that really haven't played Okay. Um, in between those sessions, really, because they're the, you want the players to get that stimulus again, to get that kind of high intensity work because they've missed it in the games. So if they go for a few weeks without games, they'll do the sort of smaller ones, like the day after a game or um, the two days after whilst the other players are recovering. But then the main sort of focus for the, t- the players that have played is that recovery element. So they need to recover. So doing 11v11s and small-sided games, you haven't really got the time to do it. So you're maybe focusing more on the sort of the medium sized games or looking at kind of like the games with uh, floaters or games with uh, unbalanced like um, players on the sides of the pitches to kind of reduce the intensity. So yeah. you're still getting like a football element of football intensity, but like you can see from the graph, like it's still low, like a lowish intensity. Mm-hmm. It's just reducing kind of the, the intensity and the volume. You don't want much volume. You want like maybe a little bit of intensity, but in short periods and then that's it like very short session perfect understood okay um felix with a question how does small side of games format or the, the use of small side of games um how with a different number of players okay so what are the effects on physiological perceptual and time motion characteristics on the on the what sorry on the so using small sided games yeah. how, how are those uh, factors so physiological perceptual time and motion how are those yeah. things affected with the use of small sided games yeah, so in terms of kind of, uh, if we're looking at, um, uh, I'll take an example of, say, that the, the Bielsa murder ball game. So um, with that one, uh, because it's so intense and it's quite a large space, so the larger the space, the more distance you can you cover really in the, that space. Yeah. So if you're looking at your meters per minute, so it's like your, your high intensity work, uh, that's going to be higher in um, the small games and high in the large games. And then the medium games is going to be a bit lower. So that kind of be a good indicator. So the say if your small sided games, your one to three, sort of one v one to three v threes, it's going to be really high in meters per minute because it's just lots of work and like really intense. And then in your eleven v eleven, it's going to be fairly high as well because it's um it's a game, so it's a game format and you've got a large space to to cover. 
really. So generally you'd see high, like, um, so if you're looking at axles and D-cells, they'd be really high in the small formats. So your 1v1 to even 5v5 sometimes, because that's lots of uh, pressing and twisting and turning and lots of sharp movements. Whereas in your bigger games, so your high, like um, in your Lemby 11s, 10v10s, 9v9s, it's going to be much more high speed running. So the, like the stuff we discussed before, above 19.8 kilometers an hour, so fast and much more sprinting as well. So you're going to get much more distance covered and sprinting in the bigger ones and then much more like intensive um, uh, axles and decels and meters per minute in the smaller ones, really. That's not okay. how you go. Yeah, excellent. Okay, uh, question from Anthony. Is eight minutes the maximum rep you would recommend or have you worked with coaches who apply a three by 15 minute reps for endurance purposes on a Wednesday, as an example? Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So that example I used before was more, it was just a research that they looked into. But again, we've done, we kind of try and follow a, a periodized approach where we build up the minutes in a way. So uh, say for pre-season, uh, we looked at starting with around eight minutes for like our endurance sessions. So on a, a day where we want um, lots of distance, we'll go for the, say like the two eight minute blocks to start with. And then we'll gradually then increase the blocks and then reduce the rest. So then that gives you that kind of progressive overload. So again, we won't go anything necessarily silly like um, four times uh, 40 minutes or four times 20 minutes if we've got games coming up. But we've kind of found that you don't need too much more than eight to 10 minutes really to kind of get that um, endurance stimulus. So again, it's like, like you said with the kind of three times 15, that's, that's useful as well to if you block it off and it's better to kind of have like the three separate blocks or two separate blocks as opposed to 25 minutes or whatever just constant work because you're going to get greater intensity through that than if you do with just a longer block because players start to slow it down and they know they don't need to work as hard so that kind of blocking off is good and just progressing that is, is important for sure okay question from jamie uh so matt we're about to return after lockdown we did provide our players at under 16s a program to work to but we're starting to plan for types of sessions for our return We'll only get four sessions in before our first competitive league game uh, back. So any advice on which format we should use to start build up from when we return? Well, four, four sessions, that's, that's going to be tricky. Um, yeah, um, again, it's quite a big increase to go from uh, if, you work, if you're just doing conditioning work at home to then small-sided games, like high-intensity small-sided games and, and large-sided games. Uh, so again that sort of beginning that even that first game almost might have to act as a little bit of a, a progression really because the the players are naturally going to find that first week really difficult so in terms of the format it's almost going back to fit like the start of a pre-season really so you're kind of introducing them to endurance based games and high intensity small games but making sure that you give them plenty of recovery so like if you're looking at um uh, an endurance game so on your three or three days before a game for example it's maybe saying looking at two blocks of eight minutes, for example, but with quite a high recovery, just so you're not overexerting the players because the last thing you want is that they're going to be absolutely knackered going to that first game. But then you do want to give them a bit of a stimulus of it because if they've not had any game stimulus and they go into a professional or full, not professional, like a, a full game, a 90-minute game, there it's going to be such a big jump, really. So it's about kind of giving them a little bit of a stimulus of each one. So giving them a little bit of like a mixed stimulus. We normally do like a, maybe a mix of an intensive, so a shorter game with a like an extensive. So the medium sized games are good because you can adapt them a little bit and increase the intensity if you want. So like, if you look at yeah, like that graph there, if you're looking at a five or a five v five, uh, again, it's not high, high intensity, but it gives you a good, good intensity for the players if you have the kind of bigger area. So it's a good way of doing maybe like a, replicating a bigger game but with less players so it's again it's that's very tricky to do in four days but um yeah it's just going to have to be something to build up week upon week really good stuff uh question from anthony so if you have access to three or four uh training sessions per week with a game every saturday would you recommend to use a balance of small medium and large-sided games throughout the week also yeah. what i guess what would be your recommendation yeah, no, definitely. I think if you depends on the the sort of day in the week, really, that you've got the sessions. But say if you've got um, two sessions in the middle of the week, 
I would definitely recommend trying to balance a small sided with a large sided game. So if it's um if you've got sessions say Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and then game Saturday, I would definitely recommend to kind of do your big conditioning days then because they'll have had like Sunday, Monday, yeah, Sunday, Monday off. So they've had a, like a two days off, which is normally like sufficient really. And then they've got um, those two big days where you could do a small sided games day on the Tuesday. And then maybe on the Wednesday, you do your big space day. So like your 10 by 10s, 9 by 9s, that sort of thing. So you're getting those two physical like developments as well as being able to work on maybe, maybe more tactical stuff on that Wednesday, for example. And then really on that Friday, you're looking at maybe medium sized games yeah, to kind of just give them a bit of intensity before the game without tiring them out too much, really. So it, it works quite well really across three, I would say. Stuff. Okay, question from Grant. Did the clubs you worked with uh, use small-sided games as a pre-exercise on a tactical day to introduce the topic? Yeah, no, I've, I've seen that before, yeah. So again, if, if we're looking at, I don't know, um, like overloads, for example, so like a 5 4 or 6 4s, um, uh, we definitely have like a kind of, it's kind of more kind of a progression of a small-sided game. So it's all like within what we'd call a small sided game, but with rules in it. And those rules are kind of progressing to a theme, I guess. So it could be to kind of build up from a general small sided game. So like maybe in, say like a six V six, and then you're gradually adding in players. So you're gradually increasing the, the number of players involved, which then changes the theme in a way. So yeah. goes from kind of warming them up a little bit into a small sided game after maybe a possession or something like that to a small sided game. And then using that and then gradually building the numbers or adapting the kind of the balance. So it could be a, say, a, a 66 and then two of those sort of defensive players uh, come out of that and then they, they join the attacking team. So then you've got like, um, uh, sorry, like 8v4, for example. So that's quite an extreme example, but adapting the kind of the numbers is, is quite common. So it could be you're working on a half pitch and it's a 6v6, 7v7, for example, and then you're, you can adapt the numbers then as you go along each block. So it could be a block, a simple small sided game, then add in a, another rule and then add in another rule to develop kind of what your your aim is for that session, really. Brilliant. Okay. Um, last few questions, guys. I think that's Ewan. Hopefully I said that right. Sorry if I didn't. When implementing small sided games, would you typically align small sided games with a daily physical training goal? For example, combining smaller areas with agility, um, COD, I'm not sure what that stands for, uh, training, or would you be more in favour of microdosing using small-sided games to cover, cover, <laughs> cover many physical traits in a training yeah. session? So, for example, smaller areas with speed training. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah. So in terms of what we'd normally do is we'd call it, um, say, strength day is our small-sided games day. So, like, uh, with our, like, when I say small-sided games, I mean, like, the 1v1s to 4v4s, for example. So, um, we'd kind of have that be our theme for our four days before a game. So we want to then are using our warm-ups to develop um, like change of direction ability. So we want the players to get better at turning, twisting, um, changing direction quickly, uh, agility. So that all kind of comes into that um, element of small-sided games because if you look at a, a really small-sided game, all of it is twisting, turning, changing direction, being able to move your body quickly. Yeah. So that's then we'd theme the kind of the warm up uh, and then also the pre warm up we do in the gym um, kind of theme that all based on because we're doing small sided games that day. So you have that kind of general daily theme of uh, a change in develop a change of direction development as well as agility. And then that kind of float flows into the small sided game. And then say the next day, normally we'll be looking at endurance or the big pitch. So we then want to focus the warm up based on that. So it's going to be more, Although with linear work, so you're doing you're doing less change in direction, so you're doing more straight line stuff. Uh, so you'd you'd kind of theme the warm up based on that, really. So yeah. it kind of all it's like in a way reverse engineering in a way. So you've got your game at the end of the session, uh, if it's a small sided or large sided, and you're trying to work out what the breakdown of the the movements or breakdown of what's required to perform that and what's required to be good at that. So you then can microdose that pretty much in your warm-ups and, and in your pre-warm-up stuff in the gym. So Perfect. it's based on a general theme, really, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it, guys. If you've got any other questions, comments, leave them in there. But um, if not, Matt, I just want to thank you again for that. That was brilliant. Thank you for all the, the detailed information and your answers as well. I think the answers added just as much to the presentation. So that was superb. 
Um, I know yeah, it's guys, thanks for, for sharing your questions. Thanks for being here again. Um, yeah, Matt, I'll leave the final word with you. No, cheers for that, guys. Um, appreciate it. the questions were really good. And again, it's always good to kind of try and develop my answers as well from it. So it was really interesting. Thanks for that, guys.